heroes of the Korean War, Jesse Leroy Brown. In 1950, the Korean War began when North Korea invaded South Korea, and the Eastern and Western blocs quickly chose sides. The Western, hoping to stem the communist tide that was threatening to overwhelm the South, sent armies to meet the North Koreans and their allies, the Soviet Union and China, on the battlefield. With them were troops of all races, including some of the first African-American naval officers. One such man was 21-year-old Jesse Leroy Brown, who had dreamed of being an aviator since he was a young boy. His story encapsulates the bravery and tragedies seen every day on the battlefield. Jesse joined the Selective Flight Training Program at Glenview in 1947, receiving positive reports from his teachers. Throughout his training, Jesse experienced severe racism. Nevertheless, the unacceptable treatment didn't deter him from his goal of becoming an aviator. Plus, he had a secret. Despite the rules forbidding it, Jesse had secretly married his girlfriend, Daisy, finding support and a lifeline in the letters they exchanged. In 1948, Jesse Leroy Brown made history as the first African-American aviator to earn his wings in the U.S. Navy. Jesse became an ensign to the Leyte, a naval aircraft carrier that held 80 to 100 aircraft and 115 pilots. He had been there almost a year, when in November 1949 he met his soon-to-be wingman, Thomas Hudner. In later years, Hudner spoke extensively about his time with Jesse and how others on board the ship perceived him. He claimed that they didn't see color and Jesse was just one of the guys. Yet in the same breath, he admits that there were members of the fleet that were so, quote, anti-black as he called it, that they refused to acknowledge Jesse's existence, unless it was to insult it. Hudner himself, though, speaks of his former comrade with respect and deference, calling him a real gentleman and noting that the black stewards on board idolized him, quote, deservedly so. Together, they became part of the 32nd Fighter Squadron, flying F-4U-4 Corsair planes, with Jesse later becoming section leader. He flew 20 air combat missions in total across Korea, with his squad at some points completing two every three days. It was brutal, exhausting work. Tragically, the flight Jesse Leroy Brown took on December 4, 1950 was to be his last. The Chosin Reservoir was the site of one of the most significant battles of the Korean War. With Chinese and U.S. forces meeting on the frozen and icy lakefront, it was a hard conflict with every U.S. aircraft available providing support, including Jesse's squadron. On December 4th, however, Jesse Brown's team had a different mission, reconnaissance. Flying over the mountainous and difficult terrain as high as 6,000 feet, the squad of six kept each other in their sights as they looked for targets to report. 45 minutes later, Jesse's voice crackled through their radios. I think I've been hit, I'm losing power, and I'm gonna have to land. What Hudner later noted was how calm Jesse stayed throughout the whole ordeal. While his team supported him, Jesse looked for a safe place to land but with the pine tree-covered mountains, it seemed an almost impossible task. Nevertheless, Hudner kept talking, making sure Jesse was following the right steps and protocol as he went down, praying for a safe escape. Shoulder harness locked. Lock canopy open. Be careful of airspeed to avoid stalling. Between these instructions, his squad mates tried to direct Jesse to a clear area, realizing his best and only option was to ride the plane down. But it was impossibly hard, and despite their efforts, Jesse's plane hit the mountainside at speed, bending the cockpit around 30 degrees due to the force of the landing. The canopy's lock didn't withstand the force of the crash, causing it to slam shut. From the air, it looked like the pilot couldn't have survived. A helicopter was radioed for, and to the team's temporary relief, they saw Jesse pull off the canopy, waving at them from the plane's wreckage. For all intents and purposes, he looked largely unharmed, but the engine was smoking dangerously and he appeared trapped. Hudner assessed the situation and believed it would take one quick tug to pull Jesse free. The only problem was, he hadn't received any order to do so. And he decided not to wait for them either. It was 15 degrees and snowy. Hudner realized that Jesse probably couldn't wait for the official order or the helicopter to arrive. Freezing to death was a very real, immediate problem. In that moment, Hudner made an incredibly brave decision. 
Despite the lack of permission, he made the choice to crash land his own plane next to Jesse's in the hopes he could save him. In the years since the Korean War, Thomas Hudner spoke several times of the hours he spent on that freezing mountainside with Jesse. By the time he reached him, scrambling onto the wing of the downed plane to reach the cockpit, Jesse's hands were already frozen and he had lost his head protection on the way down. He was trapped, his legs pinned by the cockpit and control panel. Quickly, Hudner realized his plan to pull him out would be futile. Wrapping a scarf around Jesse's hands and placing his own hat on his head for warmth, Hudner ran back to his own plane, radioing the helicopter to bring a fire extinguisher for the engine and an axe to cut Jesse free. The two men could do nothing but wait and talk. During this time, Jesse asked Hudner to tell Daisy how much he loved her. Hudner made some futile attempts to throw snow on the plane's cowling to stop the engine from smoking, to little effect. Conversation was punctured and stiff. Hudner later said he didn't know whether it was simply because it was a difficult time to carry on a conversation, or if the icy cold was already causing Jesse to slip in and out of consciousness. But throughout, Jesse Brown remained, in Hudner's own words, unbelievably calm. If anything, he supported Hudner, staying matter-of-fact and logical, simply saying, we've got to figure out some way out of here. Around 40 minutes later, the helicopter and Lieutenant Charles Ward arrived, but tragically it was to no avail. The fire extinguisher failed to work properly, and the axe had zero effect on the cockpit. Jesse remained trapped and largely silent, his body shutting down from the cold. Unfortunately, they were at an impasse. The helicopter simply wasn't equipped to fly such difficult terrain in the dark, and it was getting dark. Ward realized what had to be done. Devastatingly, they had to leave Jesse behind. Although he gave Hudner the choice of staying on the mountainside, at that point, it would have been tantamount to suicide. But Hudner went back to Jesse, assuring him they would get more equipment and return. Deep down, he knew Jesse wouldn't survive the cold that long. If he was even still alive now, he seemed unconscious. Jesse Leroy Brown died on that mountainside near the Chosin Reservoir on December 4, 1950. He was the first African-American aviator casualty of the Korean War. Later, he posthumously received the Purple Heart and Distinguished Flying Cross. But the war wasn't over for Thomas Hudner. Arriving back on his ship three days later, the captain offered to send a helicopter with a flight surgeon to retrieve Jesse's remains from the downed aircraft. It was a generous and rare offer, but one Hudner refused. It was simply too dangerous. Instead, fighter planes dropped napalm on the crash site, giving Jesse a funeral pyre on the mountainside. Now, over 70 years later, Jesse's remains are still up on that mountainside, despite multiple attempts to retrieve them. Hudner also later reported that people were annoyed at him for his choice to crash land on the mountain. In doing so, he endangered himself, the lieutenant, and disobeyed direct orders from a captain who didn't want to lose any more planes than necessary. But in Hudner's own words, he was a hell of a lot more important than an old broken down World War II airplane. Jesse Leroy Brown was a hero and a man who many aspired to be like. In the words of his wingman, the words of a man who recognized what Jesse meant to African Americans everywhere and the unfathomable tragedy of his loss. He was in the van of those leading his people across the threshold of equal rights and acceptability. He was destined to spread his influence throughout society as he grew. He died in the wreckage of his airplane with courage and unfathomable dignity. He willingly gave his life to tear down barriers to freedom of others.